Good morning and welcome to Travis Baptist this morning. You ready? <laughs> Let's go ahead and stand as we worship the Lord singing, Here I Am to Worship. Today's scripture reading is from Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Let's pray together. We love you, Lord, and we thank you so much that we are not slaves. We are not slaves to sin. We are not in bondage to death. We are not held and restrained by the powers of this world, but we are the children of the Almighty God because of what your Son, Jesus Christ, did for us. Lord, we love you for this. And Lord, today as we come before you to worship, we pray that you will speak, that you will move among us, that you will be powerful in us. Let us know what your will is, Lord. So many things going on in our life and in the world around us. We need you so desperately. We ask you, be mighty and powerful today. And God, we pray for all those who've come today that are seeking you, that are hoping that you're there, that have never known you as Savior. Maybe today could be the day that your presence is so powerful they just have to bow down and call you Lord. 
We pray for them, Lord. We pray for all these that are here. In the name of Christ, we say it all. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. We are glad you're here with us today. And um, got several announcements coming up. Um, let me see. First off, um, we are having the concert of prayer tonight at 6 o'clock over at um, Cross Bridge Fellowship, which is on 3002 Buffalo. We're going to, if enough of you want to go, be here at 515. We'll take the van if you want to ride the van or follow us, okay? Van will be leaving at 515 today. That'll go till about 7 o'clock tonight or so. We'll bring you back here. Uh, but come join us, please. And um, also this afternoon at 4 o'clock, the youth are putting something on. There's Kirk right there. He's going to come and share with us what's going on there with the youth tonight. Hello, my name is Kirk, and my role at the Travis Baptist Church is to teach Bible stories and coach teenagers in Christian living so they may grow to be spiritually healthy adults. A way to do that, to become a spiritually healthy adult, is to be able to assert yourself, to explain your ideas, to communicate effectively with people around you. As they go into the adult world, it's going to be very important for them to communicate effectively and articulate their ideas, particularly with the gospel. In this broken world, they need to hear about Jesus. So today we are having an event which will exercise their evangelism skills. We're going to have a debate. We have some adults who have a position and the youth have their position which is an opposing idea. Rather than me just shoveling information at them, rather than me just telling them answers, I want them to be able to make a claim and then to support their claim intelligently. That's what we're going to be doing here at 4 p.m. here in the sanctuary this afternoon. Uh, we'd like for you to come and take a look and see what's going on with them as we have uh, a team of the three adults and then three of the youth who are going to just discuss ideas. It'll take about half an hour, so you'll have plenty of time to go to, we've got the deacons meeting at five, and then uh, going uh, to the concert of praise tonight. So plenty of time for that. So 4 p.m. here in the sanctuary. We'd like to see you here. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. And then the um, rest of our week is getting back to normal a little bit. We will be having our ladies Bible study at 7 p.m. on Tuesday night. Wednesday night prayer meeting is back on. That'll be this Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Um, keep those in mind. Saturday is a work day for vacation Bible school and also for some stuff here at church. Here's what's going on. Um, on Saturday, uh, right out there behind the wooden fence, we have some air conditioning units. We want to pour some of that sacks of concrete uh, between the slab the air conditioners are sitting on and the wall there at the foundation um, to help stop some issues we're having there. We're going to be having about 30 bags of concrete, about 60 pounds each. We need some younger fellows, if we can, that can help move those. And um, we also need at least one more pickup to help haul the sacrete over here. So see Larry Sorrell uh, for details on that. But we do need your help about 8 o'clock Saturday morning. Okay? Um, and uh, but like I said, we got about 30 sacks to move so we could really use um, some help there. Also this week, some generous people have paid for us to get new carpet in the office area. So come Wednesday and Thursday morning, um, if you're available and you'd like to help us, we got to clean out the secretary's office and some of the stuff out of my office, get them moved out so the carpet layers can come in there on Thursday and Friday. And so we would appreciate any help you could get us just kind of showing up when you're able to um, Wednesday or Thursday. Um, Thursday, I'll be out of the office at 2 o'clock. I've got an appointment to keep. So um, uh, you'll need to come before then on Thursday. Um, also, uh, we have on the back of your bulletin the registration process for First Blessing Shoes. Uh, it is time to get signed up. We will be having 
uh, first blessing where we gift children a pair of shoes for free. And uh, that will be on August 13th. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. And so there are spots for you to fill. If you don't want to do what you've always done in the past, that's okay. Um, but just make sure that Cindy Villarreal knows that that's what you want to do. And then we will, uh, if you'd like a new job or if you've never been part of this, you're kind of new around here and you'd like to help, we would love to have you. So uh, uh, just, uh, just let us know and we'll get your name in there, okay? And so please keep that in mind. Um, again, a concert of prayer is tonight. We'll be leaving uh, around here at 5.15 after the debate is over. So, love to have you for that. If you're with us for the first time or the first time in a while, our bulletin has a flap on it. And if you wouldn't mind sharing some information with us, we'll be able to follow up with you with some information about the church. And you just tear it right off there and drop it in an offering plate. When it comes by, we would greatly appreciate that, okay? And let us go around now and let each other, or welcome each other into the Lord's house. We make it back to our places we will continue with worship and we will continue standing as we sing amazing grace Shining as the 
This time the children may be excused to head on up to Children's Church. <coughs> As they head out, the rest of us sing, God is so good. for us to pray the time we come together as a congregation, one big family, to pray in the name of Christ, to empty out our hearts, to share our burdens with Him, our struggles, to confess our sins, to empty out everything, the anxieties, the worries, the cares, the doubts, all of that. Bring them to Him this morning. He told us long ago, cast all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. So this morning, Take that time to pray. One of our deacons, Jesse Perez, will be up here if you want to come to the altar and have someone pray with you. The altar is open if you wish to come up. And, uh, but let's open our hearts up and let's pray and let's share with him what's going on in our life and in our world. Father in heaven, we love you. We wish we could reach up to you and actually touch you. We wish we could actually see you. But we know the day will come when we will be in your presence like we've never been before. Before your throne, bowing before the Lamb, listening to the praises of multitudes. And for that day, Lord, we hunger and we thirst. 
Because we look around at our world, Lord, and we see the contamination of sin and the devastation it has brought. We see lives that have been broken. We see the, the pain that has been wrought and, and the destruction. God, then we look in the mirror and realize we're part of the problem. It's my sin also. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my wrong things, wrong attitudes, wrong actions, rebellion in my heart. Father, forgive us and cleanse us. We keep thinking our sins have improved, and yet just yesterday we had another mass shooting based on racial hatred. In Buffalo, New York, God, we pray forgiveness and cleansing. We pray comfort for the families of those who died and were wounded. We pray for the family of the perpetrator, God, that they will find cleansing, that they will, that this young man will somehow or other find you, Lord. That you would break through all the hate, all the walls. God, above all else, be glorified in these situations. It is so frightening in a moment like that to be reminded how close each of us is to death. A simple trip to the grocery store. God, help us. Remind us every day how frail we are and what a privilege it is to have another chance to serve you. Another chance to live for you. Another chance to proclaim your glory. We ask you, Father, bless us. This country that is so confused, this country that is so disobedient, this country that has turned so far, Lord, we need your help. We realize now there's only a minority of us that are still calling upon you and seeking your face. But you said if we would, you would hear from heaven. And so we are. Heal our land, Lord. Guide those in leadership to make sane decisions. To act with wisdom. Most of all, to fall down before you and call you king. That their hearts might become in, in conformity to your word. We're praying, Lord for all those that are suffering loss through these days. We're praying for the students as they finish up their school year, Lord, that you will open up doors of opportunity for them to stay active in your church and in your service, that you will watch over them and keep them safe, help them make good decisions as summer approaches. We pray, God, for Alto Frio this summer as our kids get ready to go, that even now you would prepare their hearts and maybe the hearts of some friends who haven't signed up yet, but still would you want them to go. We pray you're moving upon them, Father. Help us, Lord. Help us face every crisis and challenge that comes our way. There's a war going in Ukraine still. There's an economy that seems to have tanked. Inflation and prices are rising to where many of us are being put under the stress to just simply survive. Father, help do what it takes, Lord. And maybe you're allowing all of this to drive us to our knees because we have neglected you in our life. We've neglected you in this country and we ask you to forgive. And yes, we will pray and we will seek your face. And we will ask you, Lord, to help us turn from our wicked ways and to follow you. Be with those in this church, Lord, that are hurting. Help them to heal. Help them to learn to trust that you're going to do all things in your time. We pray for our vacation Bible school coming up. We're excited that the things are finally on their way, the supplies. We ask you, God, to guard that and, and enable us to reach lost souls and new families that need Jesus Christ. We ask you, Lord, for first blessing that as the registration is opened up, that we're also going to be able to share the gospel with many this year. Lord, be glorified through this church. Continue using us and let us know that we're still valuable to your kingdom. Flow through us, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. God did not send his son unto the world to, be, to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. How deep the Father's love for us. ahead and stand for our offering as we sing the longer I serve him Yes. 
pray with me. Father God, it is a privilege to be in your house this morning, to worship you, to honor you, to glorify your name, to pray for forgiveness. Bless our congregation this morning. Bless everyone in attendance. We pray for those members that are not here with us for different reasons, for medical reasons. Be with them and comfort them. The members that have uh, medical procedures in the common days, Lord God, bless them and be with them. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the New York area. Be with them, Lord. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Yes. Bring peace to the region, Lord God. And we just praise you, and worship you, and we ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
right, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, continuing our series on life in the Spirit, and uh, kind of a, a still in kind of the context of adoption, like we talked about last week. But we want to talk today about what it means to be in His child. That anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ has a, a new relationship with God. That while we like to use the phrase, we're all God's children, in a sense we kind of are, but in a special way, those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ are His adopted children. We are part of the family, part of the household. And we're going to be reading this morning in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 will be in verses 16 and 17. And uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Romans eight sixteen. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Let's pray. What a wonderful thing it is to call you Father. To know you. To be known by you. To experience your presence. The answer to prayers. To be empowered. What a wonderful thing it is to know you, Lord. We just pray everyone here does. And that we'll come closer every day. Thank you, Lord. And we say all these things in the name of your Son, Christ. Amen. Please be seated. And uh, being His child, we have been looking in Romans chapter 8, and I just love this chapter because it's kind of like if you're stuck on a desert island and you only get one chapter of the Bible, this would be a really good one. It tells you about God's love for us. It tells us that we are not condemned if we are in Christ. That our past is forgiven. That we now stand before Him filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we follow the Holy Spirit, it tells us that our old life is dying away and we walk in a new life. And also that those who are led by the Spirit become the children of God. Adopted into the family. That we belong to Him now. Now you may say, well, that's all fine and good, but what does that mean to me? Today we want to go a little more in depth on that and, and, and to help us understand better what this relationship means as being His child. So we're in Romans chapter 8, and we read verse 16, and the first thing we see is the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the first thing we want to say then is, I know I am His. Jesus Christ, God's Son, came down so long ago. Born of the Virgin in that manger in Bethlehem, He grew up a sinless man. He was from heaven. And then He was arrested. He was crucified upon that cross. As he hung upon that cross, the sins of the entire world were placed upon him. In other words, he took the blame for our misdeeds through all history. And then he died there. But then three days later, he rose out of that tomb to show us that there is indeed, that death is not the end, but there is victory over death, there is victory over sin and all its penalties. And you and I may struggle sometimes and say, well, I know the Bible says all I have to do is believe. That whosoever believes in Him would not perish, but it's hard sometimes. But let's remember, because God has said it, I can hang on to it. I may not feel it. There may be circumstances and actions and voices that tell me that's not for you. He couldn't possibly still love you after what you did. But yet I look here into the Word of God and the Lord tells me very clearly, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit, I am a child of God. Because when I came to know Christ, immediately, we find earlier in chapter 8, the Holy Spirit comes in. He comes into my life because whosoever doesn't have the, whole, the Spirit of Christ doesn't belong to Christ. The obvious answer is that if you have Jesus, you have the Spirit. And then, above all else, He is telling you, yes, you belong. 
Some of us are so insensitive because we never pray, we never read the word, we never worship, we just kind of go along our way, and, and we're so deaf to the Holy Spirit in our life. Do we ever stop to listen? You've struggled through a crisis. You've lost something important, something valuable, someone you love. And you wonder, is God still there for you? You walk into a grocery store in Buffalo and a man starts shooting. And the next thing you know, your world has gone upside down. Nothing is going to be the same on Sunday as it was Saturday morning because of all the change that took place in those minutes that that man fired his weapon. But the Holy Spirit is there to tell you, you are still the child of God. In fact, as we go on through this chapter, it sums it all up very well when we get to the end. Nothing that has happened to you has ever separated you from God's love. Whether you got stripped naked, whether you were in a war, whether you were hungry, whether you were in any kind of trouble, none of that means that the love of God and Christ Jesus for you has ever stopped. Holy Spirit helps us understand God's Word. The Holy Spirit helps us understand as we pray, and He prays for us, we'll learn in Romans chapter 8. And in all of this, He's telling us, yes, you belong. Very simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 23. You are Christ's, and Christ is God's. You belong. If you've come to Jesus Christ, we have a little thing we as Baptists like to call the doctrine of eternal security. Some folks like to call it once saved, always saved. This is what we mean. Once you're in the family, you're in to stay. Once you've been adopted, nobody can turn you out. Nothing will turn you out. Nothing means that you've been kicked out. This is something you and I can depend on every day of our life as we battle all the problems we're facing whether in our past, whether in our mind, whether in our hearts, whether at our job or in our school, He's still there and has not let go of us. You are Christ and Christ is God's. John chapter 10, just a wonderful passage for you to read around verses 28 to 30. You ought to read it sometime. It says, you know, and Jesus says, and I have you in my hand and nobody can snatch you out. And you're in my Father's hand and nobody can snatch you out. Who's going to get you out of there? Not the devil and you can't even jump out of there. Because when God gets a hold of you, He doesn't let go. I belong to Him. I say this a lot, but I find with a lot of people, one of the biggest issues we have in life is we really haven't wrapped our heart and our head around the fact that God really does love us forever. This relationship we have with Christ means so much. And the Holy Spirit tells you, yes, you belong to Him. Secondly, once you realize, as one of his children, I have an inheritance. Look at verse 17. And if we're children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. We dealt with this a little bit last week. We talked about how you went from being adopted into the family to being named in the will. What a wonderful thing it must be to go from having to look at through the window at that family that's got everything. And then they bring you in and make you one of their family. And then they said, and you're going to carry on the family name. You're going to carry on the family tradition. You're going to be an heir. And God says to you and me, you and I don't deserve a thing. But he's not just making us heirs. Look what it says. If we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, everything I read in the Bible tells me Jesus Christ, who died on that cross and rose from the grave, now sits at the right hand of his Father. The future plan is that all powers and principalities will be his footstool. That means he's going to prop his feet up on everybody who ever exalted themselves against him. He will be King of kings and Lord of lords. He rules this galaxy and all of existence. And we're his co-heirs. We may not be, I mean, let's face it. I want Jesus to run things. But it says I'm a co-heir. I don't want to be like his vice president or anything. I just want him to run things. I just want to revel in the fact that all that's his is ours. His riches in glory, that home in glory, that dwelling place in his father's house. A heart that can cry out in praise forever and ever and ever. My inheritance right now is just a whole lot of debt. 
My inheritance right now is something that's going to blow away with the wind. Any of you that have ever come into some money, you realize, yeah, you can go through it quick too when you start thinking of all the things you could do with it. Inheritances can come and go, but there is only one that is eternal. And that is to be a co-heir with Jesus Christ. That as an heir of Christ, all things... Remember when Jesus said some things like, The meek shall inherit the earth, blessed and poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You know, all that. You look out there, and you get so frustrated with the legal system. You get frustrated with the injustice of society in general. You hate it that no matter how hard you work, you just can't get ahead. That how hard you try, suddenly, maybe you're finally out there on the top, and if something doesn't break, then the x-ray shows a spot somewhere in your body that needs to be treated. That no matter how far you've come, there's always something to knock you back down. But there's coming a day when our Lord Jesus Christ comes to rule. And all of us who are meek, obedient to Him, followers of Him, all of us who are poor in spirit, all of us who hunger and thirst for righteousness, all of us who have sought after Christ and have suffered for Him, all of us suddenly have inherited all things. And all those burdens and all those fears and all those bruises and all those bumps from being knocked back are suddenly gone because we stand together with Him now. And he is on his throne and we stand around him knowing no one's ever going to hurt us again. No one's ever going to treat us wrong again. We can't believe how good we've been done. Whatever we deserved, we didn't get it. We got so much more than we could ever dream of. Why? Because we are heirs with Jesus Christ. We're not forced to sit in the back. We're right up there with him. Oh, he'll make all the decisions. I mean, we all like that idea, right? You know, we, 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 we wouldn't mind sitting on the throne as long as we just got to experience all the good stuff and none of the pressures, none of the responsibilities, none of that. We just want to enjoy the assets. And here comes Jesus. And the Lord telling us, if we are God's children, we're His family. And if we're family, we're family all the way. Because all of His children are going to inherit His kingdom. His throne, His glories, His riches, and I'm one of them, and so are you. Amen. When you stop and dwell upon that, there's my retirement plan. I hope I can make it till then. <laughs> we go through so many things right now, but we come to realize what a blessed promise it is that He's given this as an inheritance. If you are Christ's, we already established that, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We go back to the Old Testament and there's that man Abraham that God said to him, if you'll follow me and obey me, I'm going to make out of you a great nation. You've never had a child before, but your descendants are going to outnumber the sands on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And I'm going to give you a land that is far bigger than any nation dreamed of and I'm going to uh, make you a blessing to all nations. And if you belong to Jesus Christ, you're in that plan. Because if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed. It's not about being Jewish. Abraham was Jewish. Everybody says, well, that's the Jewish. No, if you're Abraham, if you belong to Jesus, you are Abraham's seed. All those promises that went to Abraham and his descendants come to you also. We are heirs of that promise. What a beautiful thing it is. To have God basically tell you, not only are you in, you're in all the way. And since, oh, 1600 B.C. or so, maybe even longer, this promise has been out there for you. You're part of a long chain of believers. You might feel alone, you might, but listen, you're part of the greatest nation God ever raised up. The nation of faith. They came through Abraham. And the seed is not so much physical as it is spiritual, everyone who believes. I have an inheritance. All of God's promises are coming to me one day. But there's always a caveat. Verse 17, if we're children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What does it mean to be his children? If indeed we suffer with him. All right. I knew there was a catch, Pastor. 
Because if I am his child, I will suffer. Yep. We wish it was sunshine, sunshine, sunshine and roses. We wish it was all happiness and, and ease. We wish it was prosperity and money just throwing, throw, flowing through your bank account. But uh, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we hurt. If we learn anything from Jesus, we learn it is going to be suffering. Why? He suffered for us. And we're not any better than he is. Why do we have to suffer? Because the world hates him, it's going to hate us. Because this sin-contaminated world is going to rise up against that which is of God. And once you are marked as a child of God, the devil gets a bullseye on you. The rest of the world starts to think you're rather offensive. And you will find people turning away and turning against you. There may come a day when your rights are limited to the point where it's hard to even practice your faith. Where being who you are is a crime. It's God's child. Verse 17. If indeed we suffer with him. We need to look at the struggles that come our way. Not as just being attacked. But also the privilege of suffering with him. Suffering makes me like Christ. Suffering humbles me. Suffering makes me obedient. Suffering enables me and, and turns me to God. Suffering is a necessary part of the Christian experience. Whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, whether it's mental, we've all got to fight our battles. We are not guaranteed a free ride. Yes, the ticket to heaven is free. All you must do is believe. That is true. But then you enter into the battle. Now our God will carry us through that battle. Our God will give us the strength to face all the trials, all the tribulations, all the pain that comes our way. But always remember, as it says in Philippians, a, a book that, a little letter that talks so much about joy, but he says this in Philippians 1.29, It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. See, it's lock, stock, and barrel with being a follower of Jesus Christ. Bad stuff's going to come your way. Yes, you will have an abundant life. And that abundant life is usually found as we endure and overcome those difficult times. But suffering is part and parcel of what it means to be a child of God. Well, he, but you said he'd take care of me. He will. But you said he'll always provide. He will. Sometimes, while he's providing, it hurts. Sometimes that provision is like right about the time you think your light's going out. Sometimes that provision is right in that moment when you thought, I couldn't last another day, and there he is. Was he late? No. He wanted you to know he could be trusted. We learn so much in our suffering. We learn that God will come through. We learn that we can endure things we never thought possible. We learn that no matter what comes our way, our God, who never leaves us or forsakes us, gives us strength to face these things. Amen. Many of your brothers and sisters living right now and through the centuries have suffered greatly for the sake of the gospel. And by greatly, we mean much more than, than not having air conditioning on a Sunday. Because to some of us, that's the barrier. Oh, we can't come if there's no air conditioning. Some of us give up in the race if, if the politics go the wrong way. Some of us think it's all going against us. And, and the simple fact is, if you read through your Bible, you will find God's people constantly running into opposition. And then God overcomes it. He never said there wouldn't be any. But he always said he'd get you through it. There may be floods, but they will not drown you. There may be fires, but they will not burn you. To those who are called by his name, he will walk you through every one of those struggles. This disease you're going through, this ailment, this, all of it is scary, all of it is difficult, all of it is painful, and yet we stop and remember, you know, Christ, every time he looked around with those holy eyes of his and beheld the sin around him, it must have broken his heart. To have left glory like he did and walk among the sinful, the frail, the fallen. 
To sit there on his throne right now and look at our inhumanity towards each other, does it not break his heart constantly? To look down at his wounds and he's saying, I died for those sins. And yet they still embrace him. We will suffer in moments. We will go down in Romans chapter 8 in the coming weeks. And we will see, does any of that suffering mean he's given up on us? No! But in all those things, all that suffering, we are more than conquerors through the blood of Jesus Christ. So hang on there if it seems like, I thought it was all going to be good, Pastor. Oh, it's hard sometimes. You don't understand why and neither do I. But it is part of being a child of God. We will suffer with Him. And finally, I will also, let's get back to the happy thoughts. I will also be glorified. If children, verse 17, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Yeah, let's get back to that. I go through the mess. I go through the struggle. But one day you get out and you say, man, it is worth it all. It's graduation time. You look back over the years of how you struggled with that child, how you wondered, how you, how it, you, you prayed, and you, are they ever going to make it? And then there they go, walking across that stage, and suddenly all that struggle doesn't matter because she did it, and you blow that air horn there at American Bank Center, and you make all that racket. And you're happy because they made it. One day we're going to make it. To be glorified with Him. What does that mean, Pastor? Because, you know, really glorified, really, you know, except for superstars and fans thronging them, that's about the closest thing we come to. We've got no idea, but, but stop and think. What does it mean to be glorified? Jesus, in a moment on earth, He was transfigured. He received the glory He had before He came to earth. Moses and Elijah were there and all James, John, and Peter could do is just fall down and worship because, oh my, they just looked upon his gloriousness. He was full of light. He was full of, his clothes were white. He shined like nothing they could believe. That's part of what glorification is. The removal of everything imperfect, of all sin, of all that is contaminated in humanity and just stand there in the purity of a relationship with the Father. With his light shining down upon you. Think of it like this too. 1 Corinthians 15 puts it like this. This corrupted, frail, decaying body must put on incorruption. This mortal that has fallen apart and getting older, this mortal that creaks and groans every time he takes his first ten steps in the morning, this mortal must put on immortality. It means a new body coming. Romans chapter 3 says something. For all have sinned and done what? Come short of the glory of God. See, we were supposed to reach up for God's glory. We were supposed to partake in that. But sin kept that from happening. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But now because Jesus Christ has come, we can reach the glory. Everything that God intended us to be. A world of no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death. That's glory. 1 John chapter 3 puts it like this. Behold, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. So if you're kind of going, yeah, but really, what does it mean to be glorified? Well, John's going, yeah, we really don't understand it all either yet. And that's in the Bible. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That is glorification. The resurrected Christ sitting upon that throne of glory. People from every nation, tribe, and tongue gathered around. No imperfections, no hate, no sin, nothing to divide them. All that unifies them. All of these things. We are going to be like Christ. Can you imagine getting rid of every single ugly thought and bone in your body? Everything that drives you away from God. Everything you don't want to admit to anybody in this room that you say or think or feel. 
What if all that was just gone? And you just be happy. And you could just look on everyone, no matter what their state was, no matter how their appearance was, and you could just love them. That is glory. That is being like Christ. To be glorified is to be everything that Jesus is. We will never be divine like he is. But the sinless character, the exalted, the, the, the transformed nature, eternal, incorruptible, immortal. That's what it means to be a child of God. It's the place where Jesus said, I'm going to my Father's house and I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. That's where we'll be glorified. A place forever with Him. A place above and out of all this mess. As you read through Romans 8, you will see in our next little section, man, all of creation is just groaning from the pain of what sin has done to everything in existence. The animals, the oceans, the atmosphere, all that stuff. But we realize through all of it, God's going to have a plan. All these things are going to work together for good. God's making some of us something out of us that we're going to be conformed to the image of His Son. And so when He finishes up the chapter talking about suffering, this is all part of it. The process whereby you are becoming more and more like Him. This is what it's like to be a child of God. Sinclair Ferguson wrote, that in our darkest hour, the testimony given by the Spirit is there for us. It's found in the very fact that we may be broken and bruised and tossed about with fears and doubts, but the child of God, nevertheless, in our need, can still cry out, Father, Abba, as instinctively as a child who falls down and hurts their knee. Daddy, help me. Assurance of our sonship being God's child is not for the super spiritual. It's not for the 100% holy, never does anything wrong, looks down their nose at others crowd. Being a son, a daughter of the Most High God is the birthright of even the weakest and oppressed believer. You may think, yeah, pastor, I could never get there. Oh, here's the thing. You're already there. Once you're in, you're in. It came in that moment you believed in Christ. Do you feel like you're that one whose prayers never get answered? Are you that one that feels like you can't contribute anything? Are you that one that feels like I'm useless to Him? But you're His child. So cry out to your Father. The Holy Spirit told you, you're His child. Stop living like you're not. Call Him right now. Call your father. Abba, Father, come, help. I've fallen and I can't get up. Right here, right now, today. Whatever that circumstance is, that when you add all of this together, he's saying to you, he has given us all things. Why would he hold back anything? Right here, right now, today. This is why he wants you to call him Father. What are you struggling with? What do you need to let go of? What is tormenting you? What is destroying you? What has taken hold of you and won't let go? You're his child. You've got every right and privilege to walk in there right now and say, Father, I need help. We may say, I'm trying to depend on myself. Well, you know what? You're at a point where, no, I need my dad. I need my father to come in here because this is beyond me. I cannot fix this. You just totaled the car in a strange town. You don't know how to get home. You don't know what to do next. You need your dad, so you call him. Your life has fallen apart. You don't know where to get wisdom from. You don't know who to talk to. You don't know if anybody will listen. You need your father in that moment. As the child of God, because you belong, because you're written into the will as an heir, because you are suffering with him, and because you are going to be glorified with him, you are in this family. You've got the right to come boldly into God's throne room. Above all else, this ought to, passage ought to encourage us in our prayers to tell us that we go without hesitation because it's our right.
as his child to ask. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, it's so good to know who we belong to. That you, Holy Spirit, bear witness in us that yes, we are the children of God. And just as it tells us in Philippians that the entire riches of glory are available. We tend to ask for too little, too seldom, Lord. We need you to bless us abundantly. We need you to overwhelm us with opportunity, with a chance to, to share your gospel, to touch the lives of other people. Through the ministries we'll be doing this summer, Lord, that we'll have great opportunities to touch families. But there's some people here right now, Lord, that want to take that step. Maybe someone here for the first time, I want to be, I want to know I'm God's child. And right here, right now, you could confirm with them that if they will believe, then you're in the family. So, Father, we pray for them. We pray that we as believers will be more bold knowing that our future is secure, that our status is set with you. That today in these moments, lives can change. So we ask you, Lord, hear the prayers of these people. Let them be bold about it. Let them say, Lord, I need. Father, help. Come quickly. I've fallen and there's nothing I can do. Lord, come and cleanse us and heal us and strengthen us. And we ask all these things. In the name of Christ, amen. And right now, God can take you from death to life in the simple profession of your faith in saying, Lord Jesus, I believe. We're going to sing a song. While we're singing, maybe you're ready to take a step. You want to come down here and let me pray with you about that. You're free to do so. So we're all going to stand. And while we sing, you are welcome to come and let me pray with you. so much for being here today. I want to invite you back. The youth debate will be at 4. We will be heading over to Crossbridge at 515 from here. It doesn't take that long, but we got to get through all that construction over there. And then, um, but also if you want to join us, it'll be a Crossbridge Fellowship 3002 Buffalo, right off of uh, Noesis Bay and Leopard over in that area. Um, come join us 6 p.m. And um, uh, keep in mind the work day on Saturday and that we could use some help in the office getting things moved on Wednesday and Thursday. We would appreciate that. All right. And Julio Garcia, would you come and dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Pray with me, please, church. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings that you give us, Father, for being allowing us to be here together, Father, and come together and worship and glorify your name, Father. We just pray, dear Lord, that you continue to be with us and watch over us, Father, that we may be able to go to you for all things and remember with our hearts and our minds that you shall never leave us nor forsake us, dear Lord. And may we also understand through the Holy Spirit that this is not a ticket to sin, but it is to be with you and glorify with you and spend eternal life with you because we believe in you, Father. And forgive us our sins, Father, and go with us and 
heal us and if we're sick and, and just put a hedge of protection over each and every one of us, Father. We love you, dear Lord, so immensely because you died for our sins. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.